Hello again, and welcome to the final unit in our introduction to anatomy and physiology, unit 17, which is on the reproductive system. The material for this lecture can be found in the book, chapter 27, if you're interested in looking there for greater detail. And what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is I will start by talking about uh, gametogenesis. Gametogenesis is the formation of eggs and sperm, basically. The technical term is gametogenesis. Fertilization refers to when an egg and a sperm get together and form a diploid cell. Eggs and sperms are both haploid, meaning they have only one copy of each chromosome. And uh, once you have an unfertilized egg, which becomes fertilized by a sperm that's carrying uh, 23 chromosomes and the egg is carrying 23 chromosomes, you fertilize the egg, you have something called a zygote, which then develops into a blastula, which then develops into a gastrula, which then develops into an embryo, then a fetus, and then a, um, a, 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 a neonate when it comes out, and the neonate is a fancy term for a baby. Uh, so we'll talk about fertilization, we'll talk about uh, gestation and so on. Uh, we will have a brief tour of the, the male reproductive anatomy and the female reproductive anatomy, just what the different parts do. And then we'll have a, a fairly complicated discussion about hormonal control over ovulation. So ovulation refers to the production of eggs by women or by female mammals, or by any, any animals for that matter. Uh, the production of haploid eggs is called ovulation. And in humans, uh, there, the, there's a set of hormones that attempts to control ovulation so that only one egg is available to be fertilized every month uh, because there are other animals that are not quite as finicky about that. So you've seen that other animals like dogs and rabbits and other types of animals uh, have no problem giving birth to 10 or 12 offspring at a time, but for a human that's actually quite dangerous because the, the, the offspring, the baby, is quite large compared to the, to the birth canal, the vagina, and, so, and, and also the, you know, a, a newborn baby is quite large compared to the, to the adult who gave birth to the baby. And so if a mother is carrying a lot of babies, having one baby is dangerous enough, basically. Having two babies at a time, having twins is more dangerous. Having three or four is getting to be quite dangerous to the mother's health. Uh, there are a lot of health risks involved in having more than one child at a time. So as a result of that, we have a hormonal system that works a very complicated balance of hormones that works to make sure that only one egg is available to be fertilized every month. Then we'll talk about the developmental stages uh, of, of development before birth, called gestation. Uh, we will talk about some common problems with the developing, uh, developing embryos and developing fetuses, uh, which give, give rise to uh, uh, malfunctions that are referred to as birth defect defects. Uh, the, wor the word defect is, is very politically incorrect, but that's the technical term for it. Uh, things that basically go wrong with the development of a child before birth are called birth defects. Maybe someday they'll invent a, a, more, a, a more neutral word for that, but that is not quite so judgmental. But, uh, but, but for now, they are birth defects. And then, because just because this may be the only time that you've ever heard about this sort of thing, if you didn't learn about it in high school and you're just learning about these things for the first time in university, we will discuss sexually transmitted diseases. And we will discuss methods of birth control. Uh, uh, the, uh, when, when an egg is fertilized and you're deliberately trying to give birth to a child, that's called conception, con, and then in favor of. And then uh, if you are interested in having sex without having children, then you use various methods of what are called contraception. Contraception, contra means the opposite of conception, basically. So we'll talk about that as well. All right, starting with gametogenesis. 
Animals are diploid, as you know. So diploid means that we have two of each chromosome. We have 23 chromosomes, and we have two of each. And then those chromosomes, if you look at one set of 23 chromosomes, the human genome contains around approximately 23,000 genes. So that means approximately there are approximately 1,000 genes on every chromosome. And uh, interestingly, the, 20, the, the 1,000 genes that occupy a chromosome do not make up, you know, they don't make up probably more than 5% of the DNA that's present in a chromosome. So the other 95%, we're still trying to figure out what the other 95% of the DNA that you find on a chromosome that is not a gene, we're still trying to figure out exactly what that does, if anything. But nevertheless, so humans are diploid. Humans are diploid. We have two copies of each chromosome, and therefore we have two, two complete copies of the human genome in every cell. Uh, we mentioned earlier that even though we have two copies of all 23,000 genes in every cell, every cell type does not use every one of those genes. A uh, heart cell only uses a subset of those genes and the other ones are turned off. A uh, brain cell only uses a subset of those genes and the other ones are turned off. So this very complicated act of turning genes off in some cells and on in other cells is referred to as gene regulation. And we're, we're not really going to discuss that in this course, but in, uh, if you take Biology 234 or Biology 200, you, you will learn a lot, a lot more about that. All right, so humans are diploid. We have two copies of each chromosome, and basically a simplified version of it is that we got one copy of each of our chromosomes from our mother and one copy from our father. And that means that our mother and father had to produce haploid eggs and sperm cells. Right, so haploid means having only one copy of each chromosome and therefore having only one copy of each gene. Uh, so when diploid animals like humans create haploid sperms and eggs, those haploid cells are collectively referred to as gametes. Right, so sperms and eggs are both examples of gametes. Gametes comes from game theory where you take things apart into different parts and then you put the parts back together in different combinations. And so that's what a gamete is. That's why they call it a gamete. So it's a, it's a haploid cell that is used specifically for reproduction and this allows humans to put together the chromosomes and the gene alleles that are present on those different chromosomes, put them back together in a slightly different order slightly different arrangement, which then gives rise to offspring that are slightly different than their parents. There are a lot of organisms on Earth that, that uh, reproduce through something called binary fission. This is an aside, but binary fission simply means that the thing splits in half and, and, and then you have two identical copies of the thing that split in half. And so the offspring are, not, are identical to the parents. And from an evolutionary standpoint, that is not very good because uh, we want diversity in order to, uh, an organism wants to have diversity, you want to have different sizes and different shapes and organisms that, that are members of the same species, but they are slightly different physically so that they can withstand changes in the environment and possibly evolve into new species. And so uh, having parents, having offspring that are identical to the parents is not a good thing from an evolutionary standpoint. From an evolutionary point of view, having offspring that are different than the parents is a good thing. And so therefore, it, it, uh, uh, that is the reason why we do sexual reproduction, or that's, that's the benefit of doing sexual reproduction. I don't know if that's the reason, but that's certainly the reason why we have We've had such a such an explosion of many new species on Earth ever since uh, sexual reproduction was uh, developed. Right? So, during the first two billion years of life on Earth, the organisms that were around, the bacteria and the protozoa, the protists, uh, most of them reproduced through binary fission. They just split in half, and evolution was very very slow. And then, if you go, if you then look at bacteria and, and, and protists, those are simple organisms. We went, we, in the last 300 million years, we have, we've had an explosion of different types of organisms on Earth, and all of that arose from sexual reproduction and the creation of offspring that are slightly different than their parents. All right, so animals are diploid. When we want to reproduce, we have to produce haploid gametes. The process of creating haploid gametes is called gametogenesis.
All right, so the word diploid, as, as we said, diploid means having two copies of each chromosome and two copies of each gene. Haploid means you have only one. Gametes are reproductive, or cell, haploid cells that are made by diploid organisms specifically for the purpose of reproduction. So we get one set, we have 23 chromosomes and we have two, two individual sets. We got one set from our mother, one set from our father. And the set that we got from our mother and our father are not exactly the, they're not exactly the same as the ones they got from their parents. They have been rearranged through uh, a process called crossing over my, uh, meiosis during meiosis, uh, which we'll discuss more in uh, biology 234. But the, the, even the chromosomes that we got from our mother and our father are not the same as the, as the ones they got from their parents because they have been rearranged since they had them. So the fact that, they, that, that the chromosomes we get from our parents have been rearranged before we even got them, and then we get a different combination because we, have, we got one set from our mother and one set from our father, leads to a lot of phenotypic diversity. So remember, genotypic or genotype refers to the genes you have. Phenotype refers to the shape or the form that those genes appear on the outside of the body. So uh, the genotype gives rise to the phenotype. The genotype creates the phenotype. Okay, now there are two terms that we absolutely have to memorize. One is called mitosis. Mitosis refers to regular cell division. So this is when a regular somatic cell, a somatic cell is just an ordinary body cell like a skin cell or a liver cell or something like that. Uh, you have cells that are made for reproduction and you have somatic cells, which are all the other cells that are not meant for reproduction. So during mitosis, a somatic cell will divide. A somatic cell has two sets of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes in to total. And what happens right before a somatic cell divides is it will, it will copy the chromosomes that it has. So it will go from having 46 chromosomes, two sets of each, to having 90, 92 or four sets of each. Right, so the four sets of chromosomes then split so that each of the two daughter cells gets a complete pair. Right, so each of the two daughter cells, when a, when a somatic cell divides in two, or whenever a cell divides in two, we refer to the, to the cells that result from cell division as daughter cells, not sons or cousin cells or anything like that, but daughter cells. And the, each of those daughter cells needs to have two pairs, two sets, of, uh, two of each chromosome. And so they all have 46. And so in order, to, in order to guarantee that, the only way you can guarantee that is if you copy all 46 of the chromosomes before cell division. So just before cell division, a regu just before mitosis, a regular cell has 92 chromosomes. And then just after mitosis, you have two daughter cells that have 40, uh, 46 pairs each. The other word that we absolutely must know is meiosis, and meiosis is the type of cell division that you get when the reproductive organs are creating gametes, are trying to create haploid gametes. So without going into a lot of detail, what happens in meiosis is that you have two rounds of cell division. The cell, a cell divides, and then it divides again. The first time the cell divides, it has uh, the first time the cell divides, it will have 92 chromosomes and it'll divide in half and each of the two daughter cells will have 46. But then during the second division, we label these two divisions meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. During meiosis 2, the second round of cell division, the cells do not copy the chromosomes first. So when the cell divides the second time, meiosis 2, each of the two daughter cells only has one set of 23 chromosomes. And that's, uh, that's how we create haploid gametes through the process of meiosis. Meiosis, simply put, is two rounds of cell division where the chromosomes are not copied before the second set of cell divisions. All right, now we call, this is generally called gametogenesis, but we call it spermatogenesis if it's happening in a male animal, including a human. And so this is the, this is the product, uh, uh, spermatogenesis is the male version of gametogenesis where the goal is to produce spermatogonia, spermatozoa rather. So we start out with a diploid cell 
before we do meiosis one, we start out with a diploid cell called a spermatogonium. And those spermatogonia, a spermatogonium is the individual, and then spermatogonia is the plural, they are produced in the male testes. And then after meiosis, we end up with four mature spermatozoa. The word zoa, by the way, means motile or mobile so that you know that spermatozoa have little tails on them so they can swim, so therefore they are motile, they're mobile, they can swim. And so we go from calling them spermatogonia to spermatozoa, right? So a zoologist, a zoologist is somebody who, who studies animals, and that's different from a botanist because animals can move around and plants can't, right? So that's one way, and then you keep all of those animals in something called a zoo, Right? So that's an easy way to memorize the fact that whenever you see zoa at the end of a word, it means that it is motile. The female version of gametogenesis is called oogenesis. Right? And what happens, out is, what happens is you start out with a diploid cell called an ogonium. And then actually what happens is you go through both rounds of, my, of meiosis, meiosis one and meiosis two, and instead of ending up with four spermatozoa the way the male system does, Three of the three of the daughter cells that result from meiosis are kind of duds. Uh, they they are not they are not viable eggs, and we call those polar bodies. But the one cell is is actually a complete functional viable cell. Viable meaning that it can live and be re, uh, and and be fertilized, and that's called a mature ovum. Ovum is the single word, and then ova is the plural word. All right, so the term ovulation refers to a hormonally controlled process where you make sure that only one ovum is available to be fertilized per month. It's a very complicated system. Uh, the female reproductive system and control over the female reproductive system is very complicated compared to the male system, which is fairly simple. But, the, but ovulation is one of the more complicated things that the, that the female reproductive system has to do. And it is meant, it's a balance of hormones that's meant to make sure that only one egg, one egg or one ovum is available to be fertilized every month. This, by the way, you might recognize this is Nadia Sol uh, uh, Solami, I believe her name was. Uh, Nadia Solomon. Uh, she is commonly known as the Octomom. Uh, she ended up, she had the world record for giving, carrying the most babies at a time. Octa, of course, means eight, so she gave birth to eight babies. And you can see by the shape of her abdomen that uh, this is not probably not the best condition to be in carrying eight developing babies. Eight fetuses is very dangerous to the health of a mother. Uh, one is dangerous enough. It has, it has many dangers associated, but two is more dangerous, three is more dangerous, and so on. Eight is uh, crazy dangerous. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's not really natural in any way for a, for a human female to have eight babies at the time. She did this through in vitro fertilization. So if you remember the term in vitro, in vitro is the Latin word for in glass, uh, meaning in a test tube. So, they, so she, had, she was uh, doing in vitro fertilization and uh, uh, deliberately had the fertility doctor implant way too many embryos uh, after they were fertilized in a test tube. So this is not natural, but it's also very bad for the mother. We want to keep, the, if possible, we want to keep it so that only one egg is available to be fertilized at a time per month, and therefore, uh, ideally, a woman would only give birth to one child at a time. There's Nadia after she has, she had uh, two kids already, and then she had eight more, so she has 10 kids now. Uh, there are some animals that can handle having a lot of babies at a time. The average, uh, the average litter for a dog or a rat is 10 or 12 or so on. They're okay with that. But more complicated or different, uh, more sophisticated organisms, more sophisticated mammals generally give birth one at a time. So here's a horse. It's, it's a horses. It's extremely rare for a horse to give birth to more than one offspring at a time. All right, let's see what happens during fertilization. This is when haploid gametes combine. All right, let's just learn some of the terminology here. So an ovum, of course, is an unfertilized egg. We know that. 
Spermatozoa is a, sper a sperm cell that is ready to fertilize an egg. Once, the sp once a spermatozoa penetrates an ovum, and basically the whole spermatozoa doesn't go inside, uh, just the head of the spermatozoa goes inside, and the head contains only the 23 pairs of chrom uh, only the 23 chromosomes that came from the father. So once the head of the spermatozoa goes into the egg, we rename the fertilized egg as a zygote, which is now diploid. It's now a diploid organism. Now the zygote will uh, divide several times without any of the cells differentiating. So we've discussed before the fact that differentiation refers to um, uh, cells becoming specialized. So, you know, the, the originally we had, we were just made up of a bunch of gen, general generic cells that were all the same. And then some of those cells turned into kidney cells and some of them turned into brain cells and some turned into heart cells and shut down large segments of the genes, large groups of genes that were not needed in that particular cell. And so we call that differentiation. Differentiation is usually terminal, meaning that, it, that you go from being a general cell into to being a specialized cell, never the reverse. Uh, but that so initially we have a zygote, which is one cell, and then the zygote will divide a few times to make two, four, six, eight, ten, tw uh, twelve, twenty-four. You know, it, it, doubling every time, basically two, four, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two cells to form a, a kind of a, a structure that looks like a soccer ball called a blastula. So a blastula is what you get the first few days after the ovum is fertilized. You have this kind of a soccer ball that, that, that is hollow on the inside. Now what happens to that soccer ball is that one end of it sort of pinches inwards on itself to form the inside of the body, leaving the other side to form the outside of the body. And that is called a gastrula because it's undergoing a process called gastrulation. Gastrulation means forming the, the basically the alimentary canal. Uh, so the, the, the inside of the cell forms the digestive system during gastrulation. Uh, but it's still a fairly primitive ball of cells. It just happens to be partly turned inside out on its turned in on itself. And then and then after a couple of weeks, it becomes an embryo. And then during, during the embryonic phase of development, you have organogenesis going on. Organogenesis, as you would expect, organo refers to the organs, and then genesis refers to creation of the organs. And so you have a lot of cell divisions and a lot of cell differentiation going on during embryogenesis, what's called embryogenesis. So the, the, uh, the cells are busy dividing into their specialized organs at this point, and so there's a lot going on and that this and if things are going to go wrong and we're going to cause birth defects very often they go wrong during the embryogenesis phase all right so after embryogenesis is complete you have a little human that's referred to as a fetus right so organogenesis is complete there there are not many more cell divisions going on at that point the cells that are there will just grow and get bigger and uh, expand a bit and then eventually you have a neonate, which is a newborn baby. The word neonate, of course, means new. So a neonate is a newborn baby. All right, here we have spermatozoa attacking an egg and ovum. Eventually one of them will get inside. The first one that puts the head inside the ovum will cause a change in the plasma membrane of the cell, the, the outer layer of the cell, which prevents any of the others from getting inside. So in theory, it is impossible for more than one spermatozoa to fertilize a single egg. Now, here's an interesting fact. We got the egg from our mother. The only thing that our father contributed is the 23 chromosomes, right? So the mother already had 23 chromosomes. But remember, what did we call these little organs that make up the different parts inside the cell? There's a mitochondrion. There's a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. There's a rough endoplasmic reticulum, there's Golgi complex, there's some peroxisomes and lysosomes. All of that stuff we get from our mother. And we, so every cell, you know, that we, the, the, it was our mother's cell that was fertilized. And so all, all of the organelles that we, ha that we have resulted from d division of our mother's cells.
And so that is collectively referred to as maternal inheritance. For example, that means that you, you, you remember, you might remember that, that we talked briefly about a, a theory called the endosymbiont hypothesis. The endosymbiont hypothesis says that the mitochondria, the mitochondria were originally free living independent bacteria that a billion years ago were swallowed by a eukaryotic cell that had a nucleus and then just kept, instead of digesting that bacteria, the cell just accidentally kept it. And they've been there ever since and they just happen to produce a lot of excess energy that we make use of. Uh, but they're kind of energy producing slaves for us. And so they were, we believe that they were independent, living independent bacteria about a billion years ago. And as part of the reason why we believe that, part of the proof that that theory is true, we've noticed that mitochondria have their own DNA. They have their own chromosomes. So some of you may be familiar with microbiology. Uh, you know that bacteria have a single chromosome and it is a circular chromosome, meaning it's like a rubber band that has no loose end. It's kind of closed in on itself. Whereas humans have linear chromosomes where the DNA is a long linear fragment, a single piece of DNA that is not uh, a circular shape. Right now, so the fact that mitochondria have their own chromosome and it's circular strongly suggests that they have they were originally bacteria. Okay, now moving on from that, the bacteria, the the, the mitochondria have their own circular chromosome. They have their own DNA. Now, every mitochondria that we have in our body came from our mother because it was the mother's cell that was originally fertilized. And so you may have heard about DNA fingerprinting and determining maternal and paternal inheritance, determining, uh, you know, occasionally, uh, you know, sometimes a child is born and, and you're not quite sure who the parent is. Or sometimes you may find uh, a set of bones, you might find a dead body or something and you want to prove who it is and you can get some DNA from the mother or the father and you want to see if it's a match and so you can identify the dead body, for instance. Uh, kind of a sad thing to think about, but nevertheless, DNA fingerprinting or establishing maternal inheritance or establishing uh, uh, who your parents are can be done quite easily under some, some circumstances because the, the uh, DNA that you have in your, mito in your mitochondria is identical to the DNA that's in your mother's mitochondria, which is identical to the DNA that's in her mother's mitochondria, which is identical to the DNA in her mo mother's mitochondria. Because I have mitochondria that I got from my mother, she got her mitochondria from her mother, she got her mitochondria from her mother, and so on. So you can determine unambiguously and without doubt who somebody's mother is and who somebody's maternal grandmother is. That's the mother's mother. And, and you can tell who their mother's mother's mother is and so on. Uh, for as many generations as you want, you can determine the maternal inheritance or the maternal lineage of a person by looking at the mitochondrial DNA. So that's part of the maternal inheritance. On the other hand, if the mother had had a problem with her mitochondria, there are some genetic diseases that only affect mitochondria, then all of her children will have the same mitochondria, mitochondrial disease because we get our mitochondria exclusively from our mother. Just as a side note, uh, if you want to determine who a boy's father is, you would look at the Y chromosome because the Y chromosome comes exclusively from the father. So I, for instance, have, I have a, my Y chromosome is identical to my father's, which is identical to his father's, which is identical to his father's, and, and so on. So you can determine unambiguously and without doubt, you can determine the exact paternal lineage of a boy, who, who the father was, who the father's father was, who the father's father's father was, by looking at the Y chromosome DNA. If you want to determine the maternal inheritance or the maternal lineage of a person, you look you can determine without doubt who that person's mother is, who their who their mother is, who their who her mother is, who her mother is, and so on. So that's an interesting fact about the maternal inherit inheritance. We got our cells from our mother. We got half of our chromosomes from our father, yes, but other than that, the cells came entirely from our mother. All right, here I was talking about you start out with a zygote, a fertilized, a newly fertilized egg. The egg divides a few times and you have a hollow soccer ball that is, that is called a blastula. 
the blastula then sort of pinches inwards upon itself to form an inside versus an outside, and that's called a gastrula. The process of pinching inward like that is referred to as gastrulation. And this inner part will become the digestive system, the outer part will become mostly the skin, and then the middle part will become things like the muscles and so on. Eventually, the gastrula develops into something called an embryo, which is uh, during which time we have organogenesis. The organs begin to form. Uh, a few days after fertilization, a couple of weeks after fertilization, the heart begins to beat, the eyes and the ears begin to form, and so on. Okay, now here's an interesting thing. If you look at the embryo of all sorts of animals, in the early stages, they look very much the same. Which, which is another reason why we believe that we're all related to each other through evolution. So the embryo of a fish looks just like the embryo of, a, of an amphibian, you know, a, a frog, looks just like the embryo of a reptile, like a lizard, looks just like the embryo of a bird, looks very similar to the embryo of a human. It's not until later on that the that the development starts to diverge, and that's when these all these animals start to look different. But in the early stages, the embryos look very similar, indicating that we all have a similar uh, an ancestry of some sort. All right, so in the case of humans, right, so after three weeks, the embryo will develop a central nervous system and a heart. So after around three weeks, around 21 days, the heart will start to beat. You can actually hear the heartbeat in a, in a in a developing embryo. Uh, after four weeks, you have eyes forming and limbs and ears and so on. After six weeks, you have teeth at six weeks and so on. The roof of the mouth or the palate begins to form after eight weeks. And during all of this period, right, eight weeks, we are undergoing organogenesis. So the, the liver is developing and the kidneys are developing and so on. Organogenesis. During the period of organogenesis, the developing embryo is vulnerable to, to damage, which can be caused by things called teratogens. Teratogens is a general term which means things that cause birth defects. Uh, the, the word terato is a Greek, ancient Greek word meaning monster. Uh, which is a kind of a terrible thing to call birth defects, but therefore teratogens are th things that cause a developing embryo to turn into a quote-unquote monster. Uh, but the types of things that are teratogens are chemicals. So, uh, you know, for instance, if a, if a pregnant woman drinks too much, the baby could have fetal alcohol syndrome. The baby is born with a type of mild retarda mental retardation and emotional control issues which collectively is referred to as fetal alcohol syndrome. Syndrome is a, is a <clears throat> collective term that means a whole bunch of different s symptoms that are related to the same condition, but, but not actually to a single thing. So a, a whole bunch of things that have gone wrong to create a whole bunch of different symptoms is referred to as a syndrome. Uh, so, so fetal alcohol syndrome is caused by uh, drinking too much alcohol during pregnancy, which uh, and alcohol is therefore a teratogen. Uh, rubella virus, the German measles virus, is another example of a teratogen. If a pregnant woman catches the German measles while she's pregnant, the baby will be born with something called, uh, uh, co called congenital rubella syndrome, which is uh, accompanied by mental retardation uh, and some problems with the heart and problems with the eye, all collectively called rubella, congenital rubella syndrome. So the rubella virus, the German measles virus, is a teratogen as well. Now, luckily, uh, most people were, were vaccinated against the German measles vi virus, the rubella virus, when they were about one year old. That's standard, standard procedure. Uh, there are some people who are against vaccination, so they don't vaccinate their children against rubella. Uh, so then there is a danger if that one of those children is a girl and she grows up to and she gets pregnant and she contracts or catches German measles while she's pregnant, the baby will, will uh, have congenital rubella syndrome. So that, that's one of the reasons why we vaccinate children against rubella, but we also vaccinate children against rubella because the, it, rubella is a terrible disease anyway, terrible disease for the child to have, uh, and it's highly contagious, and children, before we invented the vaccine for rubella, uh, children would give rubella to each other 
on their first day of school practically and and they and uh lots of children ended up not so many children ended up dying from german measles but a lot of them ended up going deaf or blind uh or having other problems due to catching catching rubella when they were a child all right that's a side issue so during develop during the first eight weeks we have organogenesis and that is the period at which the developing baby the developing embryo is most vulnerable to damage by teratogens okay you remember what happens at 27 weeks don't you seven months of, of gestation during during after seven months of development the uh the type 2 cells inside the lung alveoli start to produce surfactant, which prevents the, the alveoli and the lungs from sticking together and causing infantile respiratory distress syndrome. So babies that are born earlier than 27 weeks uh, could, have, could suffer from infantile respiratory distress syndrome and possibly die, whereas if you go beyond that, taken to full term, the full term is 38 weeks, um, you have uh, 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 functional type 2 cells in the alveoli so you don't have to worry about infantile respiratory distress syndrome. And then when the baby comes out we have a neonate. All right now how do we determine whether you're male or female? Sex determination. Uh, first of all I'll, I'll ask the question do we really need two sexes because many organisms don't have two sexes. Many organisms divide through binary fission, so they just split in half and the offspring are identical. Many other organisms have what are form what are called hermaphrodites. Worms, for instance, are members of the of the phylum the Annelida, Annelida. And and uh, worms are hermaphrodites, meaning they have the sex organs from both sexes. They have both male and female reproductive organs. So worms are able to reproduce with other worms, but they can also self-fertilize. They can reproduce with themselves. But as it turns out, the more advanced organisms and the more complicated organisms, like including humans, have a permanent male and female of the species. And we'll discuss how, what is it that determines whether you're male or female. All right, so just beginning to, uh, our, starting our discussion of this, plants, for instance, uh, produce can produce asexually. So can annelids, the worms, and so can some insects. Okay, so flowers are hermaphrodites. They have a female. They have female parts. Right. So this, the ovules are located down here at the bottom of the uh, at, at the at the bottom of the pistil, and then the anthers are producing pollen cells, which are basically the male, the equivalent of sperm cells that fertilize these eggs. And so a plant, an angiosperm plant, like a flowering angiosperm, can very easily self-fertilize it fertilize itself, but with the help of a bee or something like that, they can also cross-pollinate so they can fertilize other flowers. All right, here we have the worms, the annelida, phylum annelida, or the annelids. Uh, they, can they are hermaphrodites as well. They can reproduce with other worms, but they can also self-fertilize and they simply curl into, a, into a, a bend and fertilize themselves. From an evolutionary standpoint of standpoint uh, it's better to fertilize with other animals because then you 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 mix up the gene alleles and create new phenotypes and those new phenotypes aid in the process of evolution but if you can't find anyone to mate with you can at least mate with yourself and propagate the species all right insects certain social insects like bees and wasps and even moths are capable of something called parthenogenesis Parthenogenesis means, parthenogenesis refers to um, where a, a female insect, like a bee, a queen bee, will lay two, two types of eggs. One type of eggs has been fertilized by a drone, and those fertilized eggs develop into diploid worker bees but some of the eggs have not been fertilized but they develop anyway you know for in, in many animals like humans an unfertilized egg will not develop into an adult but in bees and wasps and moths they they practice something called parthenogenesis where an unfertilized egg is actually capable of developing into an into a haploid adult okay so here we have on the on the right we have a queen bee Right? And she, a queen bee is generally 
when she leaves her hive to form a new colony, she mates with a drone, and then the, the drone's sperms will fertilize some of her eggs, but not all of them. And so the, the eggs that were fertilized develop into female worker bees, and the eggs that were not fertilized develop into haploid male drones, and the only purpose of a drone is to mate with a queen and then fertilize her eggs, basically. So that's an example of, so when you have an unfertilized egg developing into a fully functional adult, that is referred to as parthenogenesis. All right, there are some organisms that primitive organisms that simply divide through binary fission. So here we have a, pro, a protist called a, called a ciliate. A par, it's a, called a paramecium, which is a type of protozoa called a ciliate. And it simply splits in half and creates two daughter cells that are identical to the parent. That That is very slow from the perspective of evolution. There's a, there are other plants. This is, a, this is a sea anemone, which reproduces through budding. So you produce these little things that break off and grow into full-sized sea anemones. Uh, that's, they belong to a, a phylum called the cnidaria. I will not ask you any questions about the cnidaria or about budding or about binary, binary fission or about the annelids on the final exam. This is just for comparative purposes. Okay, this is another example of budding or, or uh, um, budding where the starfish, one of the arms breaks off of a starfish and forms a new starfish. All right, so we have those forms of asexual reproduction. But in humans, we only reproduce through sexual reproduction. So as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the humans have 22 pairs of chromosomes that are not involved in determining the sex, and we refer to those as autosomes. So we have 22 pairs of autosomes. Then we have one pair of chromosomes that determines what sex you are, one set of one pair of sex chromosomes, and, and they are of two types, an X and a Y, which, you, which I'm sure you know. So if you have two of the Xs, you're a female. If you have X and Y, you're male. Uh, what, the Y chromosome isn't actually a proper chromosome. It's a, it's a very compressed, small chromosome that only contains a few genes on it. Uh, the, the, but it doesn't matter because males have one regular X, so they can still get a hold of all the genes that you need uh, that are present on the X. It's just that they only have one of them, whereas females have two. Now, this brings up an interesting point. Is there any difference in the expression of the genes in a female because she has two X chromosomes versus a male because he has only one? You'll discuss this, this uh, principle more extensively in Biology 234, but what happens is that that women are very, the female animals are very altruistic, they're very generous, and they realize that they have an advantage because they have two X chromosomes, whereas men only have one. So they very generously volunteer to inactivate one of them. So there is a, there is a phenomenon called random X chromosome inactiv inactivation in females, which means females have two X chromosomes and they compress and deactivate one of them. And the one, if you have two, the one which gets compressed and deactivated is random. Like they don't always deactivate the one that they got from the father or they don't always deactivate the one they got from the mother. If you look at an adult woman, in every one of her cells, sometimes it was the father's uh, X chromosome that was inactivated, and in other cells it was the mother's chromosome that was inactivated. Right? So that's, that is a subject or a principle called random chromosome inactivation in females. All right, now this is related to another issue which is called aneuploidy. Aneuploidy means you have an odd number of chromosomes. So we just mentioned the fact that, that females have two X's and males only have one. Technically, that's an example of aneuploidy because it means that you have an odd, males are aneuploid, uh, they're, they're actually hemizygous, what's called hemizygous for the, for the X, meaning they only have one when they, they could very well have two. So the, the term aneuploidy means what happens if you have too many or too few chromosomes, including the sex chromosomes. Right? So that is what aneuploidy is. You should learn the term, you should learn the word aneuploidy because I might ask that on the final exam. And so there are a number of things that happen when you have aneuploidy and aneuploidy is not limited to the sex chromosomes. But there are lots of examples where uh, instead of having two X's versus an X and a Y, you might have two X's and a Y. 
if that's something called causes something called uh, causes something called Klinefelter syndrome. There might be examples where you have three X's and no Y, and that's something called triple X syndrome. And th those are all examples of aneuploidy, and we'll talk about those. There is an example of where you have three copies of chromosome 21, and therefore it's called trisomy 21, and that is commonly known as Down syndrome. So there are examples, there are one or two examples of where you have an odd number of autosomes. That is not nearly as common as having an odd number of sex chromosomes. All right, so this is just showing you, we have the Y chromosome on the left and the X chromosome on the right. You can see the Y chromosome is quite small compared to the X and it only contains a few genes. The, the X chromosome is a proper chromosome that contains roughly a thousand genes and, and a lot of those genes encode many of the functions that are necessary for life. Uh, so it's nice that men have at least one, uh, women have two, and then just so they won't be at an advantage, they generously compress one of them and turn it off. How do you know when the compression, what happens when the X chromosome is turned off? Uh, we know that it happens relatively, you know, if, you, if you're made up of, uh, you know, when, when does the cell decide which X chromosome to turn off? The process is random. Uh, if it happened when, does it happen when you have a zygote that's newly fertilized? Does it automatically switch off one of the X's, let's say the one from your father, and then every, for every cell that results from division of the zygote, is the same chromosome always X chromosome always turned off? And the answer is no. But from what we can determine, the decision to uh, turn one chromosome off versus the other happens sometime during the, it happens in individual cells at some point during the blastula phase. And the proof of that is came from studying these pretty little cats called calico cats. Calico cats is uh, where you have this interesting patchwork of different colors, and you only see this in female calico cats where they had a, uh, you know, there there are there are two genes that determine the color of the fur, and they're both uh, one of them is on the X chromosome. So the calico cat uh, is either going to be brown or black, and then if the calico cat has two different, you know, there's there's a there's a gene that has two different alleles that determine whether you're brown or black. And there's another gene that determines whether the color pigment will be put into the fur or not, into the hairs or not. But the reason why you end up having black and brown and white patches on a calico cat is because at some point, probably during the blastula phase, the cat, the individual cells decided to turn off one of the genes that was located on, you know, to compress one of the X chromosomes that contain one of the different gene alleles. So this was originally, this black patch around the cat's eye was originally one whole cell. This part around the shoulder was originally one cell that made the decision to turn off the brown gene. This, this brown ear over here was one cell in the blastula stage that determined to, decided to turn off the black gene and have a brown patch. So the decision to turn off X, which X chromosome is made sometime probably during the blastula phase. Okay, what about too many or too few chromosomes, having an odd number of chromosomes? Okay, if you have, um, if you have X chromosomes, the default pathway, if you have no uh, Y chromosome, is that you will become female. So if you have two X chromosomes, you'll become female. If you have only one X chromosome and no, no partner, so you only have one X chromosome and nothing else, you'd be a female as well. If you have two X chromosomes and one Y, you're a male. If you have three X chromosomes and a Y, you're still a male. So the presence of the Y makes you male. If you have, if you don't, the absence of a Y by default makes you female. All right, so we know that XX is female, XY is male. If something happens during, during gametogenesis, so that uh, the mother ends up producing an egg that, that has, no, has no X chromosome in it. And so the fertilized zygote just ends up getting a, a Y chromosome and there's no other partner for it. There's no partner for it. That is non-viable. That means that that would never survive, right? So we, we don't actually see that. We never see that. All right, but there are cases where one of the parents has a misfire and they fail to put either an X or a Y 
into the ovum, into the either the ovum or the sperm, and you end up having a fertilized zygote that has X and nothing. So X nothing, we we symbolize that by putting XO. So the O means nothing. So if you have XO, remember what I said, if you have no Y, by default, you're going to be female. So in this case, we have an XO, and that will develop into a female, a type of a genetic, uh, a, a genetic aneuploidy called Turner syndrome. Okay, what about if we have three X's? You have three X's, you're still a female. What if you have two X's and a Y, you're male? That's something called Klinefelder syndrome. All right, so X nothing, Turner syndrome, you're female. XXX, that's called triple X syndrome, you're female. XXY, you're male because you have the Y, which determines you're becoming a male, and that is called Klinefelter syndrome. So Turner syndrome is uh, associated with a little bit of a little bit of an abnormal development. Somebody with Turner syndrome is uh, phenotypically female, but sterile because they have kind of shriveled ovaries, have some minor heart problems, and generally have a, a, a very broad face and a very broad chest that looks kind of like a, those V-shaped shields that knights used to carry around in the medieval days, and so you call that a shield chest. And they have a little bit of extra tissue on the neck that looks like webbing. So for somebody that has Turner syndrome, uh, it can be fixed cosmetically so that the person doesn't have to worry about being different or being teased by the other kids at school or something like that, but or or not, depending on whatever the parents think is appropriate. But but this can be is sometimes treated by number one doing plastic surgery to fix the the neck and then injecting uh, injecting the girl with a lot of female sex hormones that so that she develops a more female shape but there's not much you can do about the sterility or the or the circul uh, circulatory problems you can coarctation of the aorta we learned already means that the aorta is bent you can you can fix that with surgery as well all right, triple X syndrome has no discerning features really, except that women who have triple X syndrome tend to be taller than you would expect. So, uh, that, so there, there's probably a lot of those tall runway models around the world that have triple X syndrome, and they don't even realize it because other than other than the fact that you're slightly taller than you than than a normal woman is you would ha probably have no reason to suspect that you have a genetic abnormality. So you'd never have yourself tested. And so you'd never know that you have three X's instead of two. Kleinfelter syndrome, you end up being very tall, but having gynecomastia, which means uh, minor breast development in males. So the, the have sort of uh, minor breast development, gynomastia. And then you have uh, usually a lack of body hair and so on and small genitals and that is a, those are symptoms of Klinefelter syndrome if you have those symptoms and you check yourself out and it turns out you have two X's and a Y that's that's uh, that's what that's why that's Klinefelter syndrome okay what about autosomes so the, these are abnormalities of the sex chromosomes what about abnormal numbers of the autosomes okay so there's really only one major example of that so aneuploidy is caused by a is caused by what's known as a non-disjunction event, which means that during during uh, the during the second phase of meiosis, the the two chromosomes are you know the let's say you have chromosome one, uh, you have two of two uh, two of each of chromosome one. When the cell divides, one of each is supposed to go to each of the two daughter cells. But what happens if they don't come apart? They fail to disjoin they fail to disjoin. That is referred to as non-disjunction during meiosis. And so that means that you end up having an, either an egg or a sperm that has two of chromosome one and in one, in one cell and then none in the other, right? So you can see that if, if a cell that has none gets together, if, a, if an egg that has none of chromosome one gets together with a sperm that has a, one, then that will be what's known as monosomic for chromosome one. Monosomic means you have only one where you should have two chromosomes. What do you think the term is for having three chromosomes when you're supposed to have two? Okay, the term is actually trisomy, right? So trisomy refers to having three chromosomes where you're supposed to having, have two. And monosomy means you have one chromosome when you're supposed to have two. Both of those things occur due to a non-disjunction event during meiosis in one of the parents. Okay, so 
Aneuploidy refers to having an odd number of chromosomes. Monosomy means you have one of one chromosome when you should have two, and trisomy means you have three. Okay, so we talked about Klinefelter syndrome. Is that an example of monosomy or trisomy? It's an example of trisomy. Okay, what about Turner syndrome? Okay, the answer is the answer is that Turner syndrome is an example of monosomy. Okay, what about the autosomes? Okay, so aneuploidy of the sex chromosomes is rarely common. What about the autosomes? The only example of autosomal uh, trisomy that is not lethal is trisomy 21, which is commonly known as Down syndrome. Right, so the, it, it, that means that you can have three copies of chromosome 21 and survive. Yeah, you can be born and you can live a, you can live a long, healthy life. Uh, there are some, obviously there's some effects with Down syndrome, uh, but it is viable. Three chromosome 21s is viable, meaning that you can survive with that. Any others, if you have only one copy of chromosome one, or if you have three copies of chromosome one, that is non-viable. Those um, uh, uh, developing fetuses that have three of chromosome 21, uh, three of chromosome one or three of chromosome two or any of the others except for, for number 21 or the sex chromosomes, if they have three of them or if they have none of them, they die in utero. Dying in utero means you die before you're born. You die in the uterus. All right, so here is a what's known as a karyotype. This is where you you look at you get a hold of every you get a hold of somebody's chromosomes and you look at them under the microscope. You actually take a picture of them and then you cut up the picture and paste it back together again. So here you see all the chromosomes in somebody's karyotype and then noticing here that you have 3 of chromosome 21, that is a sign that it's down syndrome. Okay? Take a look at this at this uh, karyotype and you tell me whether this is a male or a female. Okay, the answer, of course, is it's a female because we have two X's over here. All right, so Down syndrome has a set of, uh, you know, uh, effects, one of which is having one of the characteristics of Down syndrome, trisomy 21, is that you have an enlarged tongue and you have a kind of a flat, broad forehead and a little bit of mental retardation, which varies in various degrees. You have some digestive problems because there's some problems with the digestive system, and sometimes there's a little bit of problem with the heart as well. Generally, you have a short stature. You're a little bit on the short side, have a very broad face. The eye has, a, uh, the eye has an ep epicanthal fold, which is, uh, uh, you know, it looks kind of Asian type of eye. Uh, whether you're Asian or not, and usually a lack of uh, philtrum, that little groove that comes down from your nose is, is shallower than it otherwise would be, uh, characteristic of Down syndrome, also a characteristic of fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, now here's something <clears throat> which is unfortunate and tragic, but, I, but, but uh, you can always plan your life better when you know the truth. So I won't sugarcoat this for you, but this is a this is a graph showing the frequency of down syndrome births related to the age of the mother in the the mother when she gave birth all right so you see that if a woman gives birth to a child when she's 20 the odds of the child having down syndrome are about 1 in 1500 which is very low age 30 one, odds of having a Down syndrome child are 1 in 1,200, still very low, but this curve starts to bend upwards the older the mother is, and a woman who gives birth to a child when she's 45 stands a 1 in 25 chance of having a Down syndrome baby. Right, so the longer you wait to have children, the greater the odds of having a Down syndrome baby which is completely unfair to women because men can go on having children at any age. The, there's no effect on the sperm cells. But for the women, the, the, the problem is that the older you are, the greater there start to become some problems with gametogenesis. So the older, the older you are when you have children, uh, the, the, the greater the chance of having a Down syndrome baby. Um, you can do other things. You can you can freeze down some eggs when you're young and fertilize them when you're older if you want. Uh, that's a possibility. But you should be aware of the fact that if you delay having children until uh, middle age, there are risks involved with that. 
All right, so we have 22 autosomes, 22 pairs of autosomes, one pair of sex chromosomes. The presence of the Y makes you a male. Otherwise, you're a female by default. You only need one X. You can live without the Y. Uh, females inactivate one of them because they have two. Males only have one to begin with. Aneuploidy refers to having an odd number of chromosomes. It's caused by something called a non-disjunction event during meiosis, and it can it can result in either trisomy or monosomy in offspring. And as we said, trisomy and monosomy is fairly common with the sex chromosomes, and it's usually viable. You usually live, so people uh, it's easy to survive if you have two X's and the Y, that's Klinefelter's. If you have uh, just one X and nothing else, that's Turner's, no problem. If you have triple X, no problem. But it's harder to survive if you have an odd number of autosomes. And the only one that's really viable, the only one that you can really survive from is trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. Okay, let's move on to a slightly different part of the lecture now and talk about the male reproductive anatomy. Okay, so the sperm during spermatogenesis is produced in the testes. It's, it's, it, the, spermata, the spermatozoa are produced inside little microscopic tubes that are about the same diameter as a spider's web or a thread that are referred to as seminiferous tubules. And we'll see how that works in a minute. The spermatozoa then travel from the, from the seminiferous tubules in the testes. They travel to the penis through a larger tube called the vas deferens. There is a form of sterilization that men can do. So that if they don't want to have any children or if they don't want to have any more children, they cut the vas deferens, which is referred to as a vasectomy. And that prevents the sperms, the spermatozoa, from getting from the testes to the penis. Uh, if they, the vas deferens continues uh, its journey from the testes to the penis by passing through a large gland called the prostate gland. The prostate gland produces certain lubricants and fluids that are added to the sperm cells to, and together the sperm and the fluids that are produced by the prostate gland and other glands are collectively referred to as semen. Right? So semen contains sperm, but semen is not the same thing as sperm. Semen is a mixture of uh, sperm and various other fluids that are produced by the prostate gland and some other glands. And then eventually the vas deferens connects to the urethra. Remember that the urethra is a tube that, that leads from the bladder. And so men actually use the urethra to send out both sperm and urine. Right, so that there's a at a certain point there's a single tube in the in the penis that that sends out either sperm or urine, whereas in women they have two different holes. There's a vagina for sexual reproduction, and then there's a urinary meatus for urinating. Uh, so so men use the same tube at the you know to, for sending fluids out of the penis, both uh, both semen versus urine. All right, now the penis itself is a tube basically, but it obviously can't get into a vagina unless it's hard. And so the, the penis contains a lot of uh, spongy tissue that's referred to as erectile tissue, which is mainly just, it's basically just a whole bunch of capillaries. And if you pump blood at high pressure into the capillaries, the, the penis will erect, which is, and so this is responsible for that. Now, like all uh, capillaries, there are precapillary sphincters that can divert blood either to, to those capillaries or away from those capillaries. And as men get older, they often, they often suffer from something called erectile dysfunction, or ED. And that means that the, the precapillary sphincters in the erectile tissue malfunction, so they have trouble sending blood into the capillaries inside the penis, and so it will not erect. That's called ED, or erectile dysfunction. And there are various drugs that are meant to combat that problem. So the, the drugs that were invented are go under the brand name of Viagra or Cialis. So whenever you see these commercials for Viagra and Cialis, that's that's what they're talking about. These are drugs that uh, help the precapillary sphincters and the erectile tissue to function properly. So erectile dysfunction is one of the more common problems with the male reproductive system as men get older. It's, it's one of the more common ones. There are various problems with the female reproductive system, but the, that is one of the main problems with the male reproductive system for older men.
All right, so here's just the diagram of the whole thing. All right, so here we have the here we have the seminiferous tubules down here in the testes. The skin surrounding the testes is referred to as the scrotum, and then they lead into the vas deferens, which kind of circles around behind the bladder, and then joins into the urethra on the other side, traveling inside a structure called the inside a, a structure called the prostate gland. All right, so the prostate gland. There's a problem, there are potentially problems with the prostate gland as well, and that is the fact that when men get older, the prostate gland swells up and pinches off the urethra, making it difficult to urinate. So that's called enlarged prostate. And so again, you'll see a lot of, a lot of uh, commercials on television advertising drugs that are meant to treat uh, enlarged prostate. All right, here's a side view. So here we have the testes containing the seminiferous tubules. This large structure here, which is kind of where the tubules come together, is called the epididymis. And then it gives rise to the vas deferens. There are two of them, a left and a right. And the two vas deferens circle around behind the bladder back here. And then they join the urethra inside the prostate gland. So notice that inside the prostate gland, the vas deferens joins with the urethra so that uh, you can send either sperm or urine out through the penis. This is a closer look at one of the seminiferous tubules. So here we have a testy, and then if we pull out one of these seminiferous tubules, it's like a little tiny thread. If you take a if you take a transverse cross section through the thread and you look, you'll see inside what's happening is that the the immature spermatogonia are lining the outside of the seminiferous tubule. And as they move from the outside into the hollow spot in the center, they develop a tail. This is so meiosis is happening, uh, uh, spermatogenesis is happening from the outside of the seminiferous tubule towards the inside. So we have the immature spermatogonia on the outside, and in the lumen, the hollow part in the center, we have mature sperm with tails swimming away and then taking off down the taking off down the vas deferens. Okay, so what's going on in here is all of this, right? So at the at the outer edge, we have the spermatogonia. They are diploid. Then we have my, mitosis for self-renewal, basically, to replace the ones that have left. And then we have meiosis one and meiosis two. And then we end up having giving rise to four mature spermatozoa. So one, spermat one diploid spermatogonia gives rise to four haploid sperm uh, spermatozoa. Now let's talk a little bit about the structure of a typical spermatozoa. Okay, so it has a tail, of course. This is basically a flagellum. So you've heard the word flagellum. Flagellum is the Latin word for whip. So this is a whip that the, sper the spermatozoa uses to uh, uses to swim. Okay, they, you'll see in a minute that the spermatozoa has to swim a long ways before it can actually fertilize an egg. And so if it's going to swim a long way, it needs a lot of energy to power the, the tail, and that energy is provided by the midpiece. Okay, so what's in the midpiece? The midpiece contains a whole bunch of mitochondria, which are the energy-producing factories that produce a, uh, break down glucose and produce ATP as an energy source. Okay, and then in the head, we have a nucleus, which is where the 23 chromosomes from the father are, plus in the very front, we have a little package that's filled with enzymes, and that, that package is called an acrosome. The word acros means to attack, you know. So the acrosome, you know, you talk about an acrimonious argument, means you, and you're attacking each other. During, so an acrosome is used by the spermatozoa to attack the egg, and that the, the acrosome contains enzymes that help the head to penetrate, dissolve, a little hole in the cell membrane and allow the head to penetrate the ovum. Uh, so, <clears throat> and then what happens is the midpiece and the tail break off and stay on the outside. Okay, now that's significant. The fact that the midpiece stays on the outside, that is because, as I told you, that, that's the, that is the reason why we are able to trace somebody's maternal inheritance, because none of the father's mitochondria got into the egg when it was fertilized. The fertilized egg contains only mother's mitochondria, and therefore you can look at the DNA in the mitochondria and you can determine without doubt who somebody's mother is and who somebody's maternal grandmother and maternal great-grandmother is and so on.
All right, so the spermatozoa attack, then the acrosome, when one of these heads reaches the, the surface of the egg, the acrosome releases the enzymes which allow the head to get inside, but the midpiece and the tail remain outside. Okay, so we start out with a diploid spermatogonium. Then during meiosis one, we create what are called two secondary spermatocytes that are haploid. And then those haploid cells divide during meiosis two to form four spermatids, which then differentiate into mature sperm. They grow a flagellum and so on. And this process happens from adolescence until death, right? So it happens during the onset of puberty until death. Uh, the spermatozoa from a 90-year-old man are just as good as the ones from a from a 20-year-old man, uh, which is kind of unfair because because. Uh, you know that means that you can have you can you can father a child at any age, but mothers uh, women are kind of stuck having children within a certain age limit. All right, so there we are again. Now let's look at the female reproductive anatomy. Okay, so this occurs in the ovaries, which you find on either side of the uterus. Right, and so you start out with a diploid ogonium, which undergoes two rounds of meiosis, and you end up creating one secondary oocyte. And this is a mistake, it should say three polar bodies, three polar bodies, right? So three of them are duds, basically. Uh, and one of them is a functional oocyte. The oocyte is stored in a structure called a follicle inside the ovary. And the follicle is the developing oocyte. So the oocyte will, will develop into a mature ovum, but only after a while. It has to spend some time inside its follicle. And the follicle is made of a, 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 a circle of cells, a, a ball of cells that are referred to as nurse cells. N-U-R-S-E, nurse, as if they were a bunch of nurses that were tending to a baby. Right, and the baby that is growing and developing is the the oocyte that develops into a mature ovum. Right, so we have the ov the the oocytes are contained inside the ovaries in structures called follicles. The follicles are made of nurse cells that are feeding various proteins and growth factors and cytokines to the developing oocyte until it becomes a mature ovum, and then it bursts out of its follicle and starts traveling down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. The when the ovum, when a mature ovum bursts out of its follicle and starts traveling down the fallopian tube to the uterus, this is the result of hormones that have been released from the brain. So we will talk about that. All right, so here we have an ogonium. It undergoes various rounds of meiosis and then we end up with three polar bodies and one functional oocyte. Which, can, which is available to be fertilized after it, the ovum matures and breaks out of its follicle. All right, so the ova, individual ovum, ova plural, are produced in the ovaries. Those are the female gonads. When they burst out of their follicles, they travel down the fallopian tube to the uterus. And generally, they meet us, if they're going to be fertilized, they will meet up with the sperm inside the fallopian tube, which is quite a long ways away from the uterus. So fertilization takes place in the fallopian tubes, which is something most people don't realize. They think that the fertilization takes place in the uterus, but no. The sperm have to swim all the way up the vagina, all the way through the uh, all the way through the uterus, all the way down the fallopian tube, and they usually run into an egg and fertilize it when the egg is fairly close to the fairly close to the ovary. So the sperm have to swim quite a long ways to fertilize an egg generally. Okay, once the once the egg has been fertilized in the fallopian tubes, the egg continues to divide as it travels towards the uterus, and by the time it gets to a uterus to the uterus, it's already a blastula. And the blastula implants itself into the end into the endometrial wall that is the 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 columnar epithelium the specialized columnar epithelium that lines the inside of the uterus so you remember at the beginning of the course we said that endo, endometrium is the special name we give to columnar epithelium that you find lining the inside of the uterus and then by that time the endometrial wall has swollen up and been reinforced with new blood vessels that are there to bring nutrients to the developing baby. Right? And so <clears throat> they, it develops inside the uterus once it affixes itself to the uterine wall, to the endometrial wall. 
The cervix is a little muscular sphincter that guards entry into the uterus from the vagina. The vagina is the tube that, that leads between the outside of the body and the uterus. Right? And the outer folds of the vagina are referred to as the vulva, the external folds, including the clitoris and the labia minor and the labia, labia majora, labia minora. Okay, so the urethra comes out of the urinary meatus, which is located just anterior to the vagina, but it is inside the vulva. Okay, so here we have a diagram. So here we have the ovaries, and within the ovaries we have follicles, and those follicles uh, are, are allowing the development of o immature oocytes developing into mature, uh, into mature ova. Eventually, a mature ova will burst out of its follicle and start traveling down the oviduct or the fallopian tube. And if it meets a sperm somewhere in here, it will be fertilized and the, fer and the, the, the ovum will turn into a zygote. The zygote will start div dividing into a blastula and after a day or two, it will arrive in the, in the uterus and implant itself. The blastula will implant itself in the endometrial wall, which is now swollen up and filled with new blood vessels. So down here we have the cervix, which guards the entry to the to the uterus from the vagina side. The vagina is a tube that leads from outside to the uterus. And then on the outside of the vagina, we have the vulva. Okay, here's a side view. Notice that, so here is the uterus, and notice that the, the, uh, that the ovaries are slightly above and, and behind the, the uh, uterus the oviducts lead to the uterus. And then, so here we have the cervix, and then here we have the vagina, and then here we have the vulva on the outside. Right? And there are various glands that produce lubricants and so on. Here's the pubic bone. And notice that in between the uterus and the pubic bone, we have the urinary bladder. So that's, the, that's interesting because it means that when a woman is pregnant, the baby is developing inside the uterus, which takes up more and more space, and there's less and less space for the urinary bladder to fill up with urine. So uh, a pregnant woman who's like in, in her third trimester, you know, he's seven, eight months pregnant, seven, eight, nine months pregnant, has to urinate quite a lot because the urinary bladder has very little volume. So there's not much room in the ur in the bladder. So that's one thing that uh, pregnant women have to experience is having to urinate a lot during their during the third trimester. Okay, so as I said, here we have the follicles that contain the developing oocytes, and when one of them develops into a mature ovum, it will burst out of its follicle and start traveling down the fallopian tube to the uterus. If, if nothing fertilizes it, if it doesn't meet any sperms, it'll just go out, and that's menstruation. However, if it does get fertilized, it will usually get fertilized there somewhere, right? And then, it, then the zygote will continue to divide into a blastula, 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 and then the blastula will implant itself in the swollen endometrial wall. Now, the, you know that um, you all, you've already been introduced to the idea of the placenta. The placenta is what the baby uses to filter oxygen from the mother without actually coming into contact with the mother's blood. So when the blastula makes contact with the endometrial wall, the area where the contact takes place swells up and turns into a structure called the trophoblast. And the trophoblast is what will develop into the placenta. And here's the placenta. Okay, so the placenta is this filter where the mother's blood vessels and the baby's blood vessels come very close together, but not close enough together to actually mix the blood, but close enough together to exchange gases and, and nutrients, carbon dioxide, oxygen, amino acids, and so on. Uh, proteins like antibodies can actually cross the placenta, so that, that sometimes results in a problem if you have an Rh positive father and an Rh minus mother. We talked about that earlier. And notice that, of, of course, the blood, the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood travel back and forth to the baby through the umbilical cord, which connects to the belly button, basically, the umbilicus, the navel. Okay, I'm going to show you an actual placenta, so brace yourself. Okay, uh, well, I guess I'll show it later. Right now, I'll just mention the fact that uh, there is a couple of, pro let's discuss a couple of 
pathologies with the female reproductive system. We discussed the male reproductive system. Two problems are erectile dysfunction and enlarged prostate, two problems with the male reproductive system. Two potential problems with the female reproductive system. One of them is called endometriosis. So what happens with endometriosis is that the endometrial tissue, the endometrium, grows out into the fallopian tubes where it's not supposed to be. Right? And that means that the fallopian tubes are narrower than they should be because endometrial t and the endometrium swells up just before menstruation because it's, it's being enlarged because new blood vessels are being added to it. Right? And then if the, if the egg is not fertilized, the egg just goes out and then all of these new blood vessels just kind of dissolve and fall out uh, with menstruation. Uh, so endometriosis is where the endometrium grows out into the fallopian tubes, and because the fallopian tubes are narrower than they otherwise would be, when the egg goes by, uh, it has trouble getting by and it causes a bit of pain. So uh, women that have endometriosis have very pa uh, painful menstrual cycles. All right, now, as you know, the, the, a fertilized egg is made to implant, it's meant to implant inside the endometrial wall. What happens if the endometrial wall has grown out into the fallopian tubes the way it does in somebody who's suffering from endometriosis? Well, then you might have something called an ectopic pregnancy. The word ectopic, the word ectopic means in the wrong place or at the wrong time. Usually it means at the wrong, in the wrong place, right? So, what this means, an ectopic pregnancy, is where the fertilized egg implants into the fallopian tube instead of into the endometrial wall, and then as the baby develops, obviously the fallopian tube doesn't have much room to expand the way the, that the uterus does. So the ectopic pregnancy, the developing embryo, will actually break the fallopian tube, and that's a common cause of sterility in women if they have... Uh, one, one of their fallopian tubes was broken by, a, by an ectopic pregnancy. They can try and sew it back together, but it may not always work. Um, and occasionally, if a woman has endometriosis so that both fallopian tubes have endometrial tissue inside, it's very possible she'll have two, um, ha have two different ectopic pregnancies and break both fallopian tubes and then not, not be able to have any more, ch any more children. Okay, now this topic is very difficult for people to understand, but this we're going to go into hormonal control of ovulation. How do we guarantee or how do we try to guarantee that only one egg is available per month? We want to avoid this. Okay, sorry about the small hand about the small writing, but we'll go through this slowly and you can rewind the video and, and, and look at it. So starts off at the brain. The brain releases a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH. That causes the brain to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland which causes the follicles in the in the uh, in the ovaries to become mature. Right? This so this happens during the first 3 weeks, uh, sorry, the the first 2 weeks of the menstrual cycle. And it is referred to as the follicular phase because during, during the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone along with follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, the follicles, it's even in the name, follicle stimulating hormone, the follicles are feeding the developing oocyte and causing it to turn into a mature ovum and until it's ready to be released. Okay, after about two months, after two months, after about two weeks of development of the follicles, there's a spike, a sudden, a spike is a sudden increase in the amount of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that's released from the brain. And this spike, this sudden increase in these two hormones will cause the most mature ovum to burst out of its follicle. It will cause the release of the most mature of the, of the uh, ova that's, that's just about ready to go. Now, Usually one is ready before the others, but if two of them are ready at exactly the same time, they'll both be released and that's when you have the possibility of having twins. Or, by a coincidence, you might have three that are ready to be released during the follicle, uh, the spike in, in follicle stimulating hormone and, and then you could have triplets and so on. Right, so, but generally one of them is more mature than the others and it bursts out of its follicle and starts traveling down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. Now, what's left of the follicle that it came out of will swell up and form a structure called a corpus luteum. 
Right, so a corpus luteum is the remnants of a follicle that has swollen up, and the corpus luteum will start producing will start producing two hormones that prevent the other follicles. It actually prevents gonadotroph. It, it'll produce two hormones called estradiol and progesterone. Progesterone is a hormone that prevents gonadotrophin from being released from the brain up here, and thus prevents any more of the follicles from maturing. Right, so the first follicle to be released, the 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 first the first follicle to release its egg, its ovum, will swell up into a corpus luteum, which produces progesterone, which prevents any of the other eggs from developing. To make sure that we only have one egg available for development every month, you've heard of hormonal birth control pills. What do you think is in hormonal birth control pills? Progesterone. Right, so there's a there's an urban myth, there's an incorrect myth that says hormonal birth control pills, when a woman goes on the pill, that those hormonal birth controls prevent her from conceiving a child after sex. They prevent her from conceiving a child because it prevents the fertilized eggs from implanting in the in the uterus so that you have all these fertilized eggs that are just going out. That's actually not true at all. In fact, what happens is the, the hormonal birth control pills will prevent any of the follicles from maturing, prevent any of the developing oocytes and ova from maturing to the point where they will be released. Right? So basically those birth control pills are fooling your body into thinking that there's already an egg that's been released and so we, we don't want to release any more. Right, so that anyway, so that's what's in birth control pills. But the the final two weeks of ovulation is referred to as the luteal phase, because that phase is dominated by the corpus the corpus luteum producing producing progester, progesterone and estradiol. By the way, don't confuse the word corpus luteum with corpus callosum, which I almost did there. Uh, that's that's an excellent tricky question for the final exam. Corpus callosum, of course, is a part of the brain, and corpus luteum is something you would find in ovaries. Okay, so here we're showing a, a cross section of an ovary. It's filled with follicles that are that are causing eggs to mature, and those eggs are at different stages of maturity. So then, as the developing egg the ovum develops the follicle gets bigger and bigger until finally it's so big and it has this nice big beautiful ovum inside it that big ovum will burst during the spike in luteinizing hormone and and follicle stimulating hormone and come out that egg will start traveling down the oviduct to the to the uterus and what's left of the follicle will swell up and turn into a structure called a corpus luteum that releases progesterone and estradiol. Eventually it will run out of steam, it'll run out of energy and sort of collapse and then it'll be time for another, that'll, that won't happen in, for a couple of weeks and then we will release another egg and then the follicle that that egg came out of will swell up and become the corpus luteum. Okay, I apologize for how small this graph is, but on the top you see the development of the you see the development of the uh, follicles, development of the ovum inside follicles, right? So here we have a follicle that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Now this graph here is showing you how much follicle stimulating hormone and how much luteinizing hormone is being released by the brain, right? So during the first two weeks of ovulation there is a certain amount of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that is being released which is causing the the eggs to develop inside their inside their follicles it is also causing the uh, uh, the this is the this is basically day 1 of after menstruation right after menstrual bleeding so then we have the we have the uh, we uh, we have the first the first stage, the, the follicular phase of the follicular phase of menstruation. And then there's a sudden increase or a spike of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone that causes the most mature egg to burst out of its out of its follicle and start traveling down on its way to the uterus. And what's left of the follicle swells up and turns into a corpus luteum, which secretes estrogi estradiol and progesterone during the last two weeks of menstruation, which number one, prevent any other eggs from maturing and being released, and number two, starts preparing the endometrium to receive the fertilized egg. Right? 
Okay, if there's no fertilization, then this whole thing just goes back to the beginning. We release the egg and then we go back to the original structure for the, for the endometrium and then we start uh, developing another egg and we start all over again. <clears throat> this is just a close-up showing you that during the, during the follicular phase, right, we have luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, which are working to mature the eggs that are in their follicles. The most mature one will burst out when we have a sudden spike or a sudden increase in luteinizing hormone and fo follicular stimulating hormone. And after that, we have, we have the corpus luteum, which is, uh, which is producing the progesterone and estradiol. Okay, so here is the progesterone and estradiol being produced during the luteal phase of menstruation, which is actively preparing the uterus to receive a fertilized egg and at the same time preventing any of the other eggs from maturing and coming out. The progesterone and, and estradiol are also helping to prepare the endometrial wall to receive an egg. So here we have day zero of menstruation, right after bleeding. Then we have five days, and then as we get to 10, 15, 20 days, and so on, the, the walls of the uterus are filling up with new blood vessels, which will be there to receive, you know, to turn into uh, the placenta and to feed the developing uh, fetus. All right, so that's the, the, the graphs combined. Okay, so remember, just the brain causes the brain releases gonadotropin releasing hormone, which in turn causes the pituitary gland to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. This causes maturation of the follicles and the the ova that are inside. Eventually, there's a spike, a sudden increase in these two hormones after about two weeks, which causes the most the most mature of the eggs to be released, and what's left of the follicle swells up into the corpus luteum. Uh, that produce estradiol and progesterone. Progesterone prevents any of the other follicles from maturing, and that is why artificial progesterone is what they put into hormonal birth control pills. So basically what, what's happening when you take hormonal birth control pills is the, these hormones are fooling your body into thinking that there's already an egg that's been released, and you don't want to release any more to avoid having more than one fertilized egg at a time. All right, now... This unfortunately doesn't last forever, and then as a woman uh, approaches her 40s, late 40s, and so on, the uh, the hormones that control ovulation start to drop off. The way hormone levels generally do drop off when you're over 40 or over 50, all all sorts of hormone levels drop off, including the ones that cause ovulation. And so then, for women, that that period is referred to as perimenopause, the period just before menopause, where the the hormone production becomes less and the menstrual cycle becomes more irregular. So when a woman has her first uh, first menstruation, you know, age 12, 13, 14, the, 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 the number of days between, between menstruations may vary a little bit. And then eventually when, you know, when she's 15, 16, between the ages of 15, 16 and the ages of 45 or so, uh, a woman will generally be fairly regular with when, when her menstrual cycle, uh, how, long it, how long it happens, you know, how many days between menstrual cycles will be fairly consistent. And then when the hormone levels start to drop off, the number of days between menstrual cycles can either increase or decrease, you know, like a couple of weeks between periods versus a couple, versus a couple of months between periods is not uncommon for a, a perimenopausal woman. Um, some some women notice an increase in sexual desire at that point, uh, and some women notice a decrease in sexual desire at that point. So some things happen with the sexual desire at the same time. Uh, and then you hit menopause where ovulation stops. So menopause is the stopping of uh, ovulation. This leads to a decline in estrogens. We learned from the uh, section on the endocrine system that ex estrogens are responsible for determining the female body shape. So the female sexual secondary characteristics start to, start to decline. Uh, so at that point, uh, postmenopausal women or women that have already gone through menopause, they stopped ovulating a while ago. Uh, sometimes they'll, their voice will become hoarse. Uh, they'll, they're, they're, um, uh, you know, they, they will start to develop more facial hair and have to have the, you know, the facial hairs plucked out of their face. The f facial hairs will become more coarse and so on. And this is because of the decline, due to the decline in estrogen. Um, 
also with the drop off in hormones for both men and women, you you notice that you tend to be a little more rational um, uh, because hormones are not are not causing all kinds of upheaval with your emotions, which hormones do. Um, I, when I was just as a side story, when I when I was a young man, I remember that there was a there there was I heard a feminist giving a speech who said that she thought the world would be a much better place if it was run exclusively by postmenopausal women. And I remember at the time thinking, well, that's a very sexist remark. But now, now that now that I'm in my 50s, I, ha I happen to agree. I think it probably would be a better place if it was run by exclusively by postmenopausal women. But that's not part of the course. That's just a just an aside. All right. So that is the the perimenopause and menopause. Uh, men, by the way, go through a drop off in in the production of testosterone and a lot of the a lot of the androgens, the male hormones, when they're in their 40s and 50s, and eventually when they're in their in their 50s, they go through a, a severe drop in testosterone and gr human growth hormone and other things, which is uh, referred to as andropause. The technical term is andropause because androgens are the male hormones, estrogens are the female hormones. I don't know why they call it menopause instead of estropause, but the the term for the male the term for the female halting of ovulation is menopause the term for the male sort of a male version of it is called andropause okay so the sex hormones begin to be they're they they're produced during adolescence and continue on for the rest of, for until andropause or, or menopause Okay, so the, the male androgens, the androgens including testosterone, for instance, causes the development of male secondary sexual characteristics. The, you know, the fact that men are hairier than, hairier than women, uh, they lose their hair more easily, uh, they, they, uh, uh, they can develop muscle more easily, and they can lose adipose tissue more easily. Uh, the female estrogens, estrogens are a class of hormones, steroid hormones, that cause the development of the female sex secondary sexual characteristics as I mentioned secondary sexual characteristics I mentioned that in the in the endocrine section of this course that refers to uh, uh, body characteristics that identify you as a male or a female but which are not I actually involved directly involved in reproduction they are not reproductive organs right so they, they are simply characteristics about the body that develop that uh, identify you more as a male or a female Okay, what are sec examples of secondary sexual characteristics? Well, in humans, of course, it's the female and versus the male shape, right? But humans are not the only animals that have secondary sexual characteristics. So, for instance, the male male deer have antlers and the females don't. So, the antlers are considered to be a secondary sexual characteristic. And this is a this is a side note, by the way. I'm not going to ask you about antlers on deer, but this is just an example. As biologists, you might be curious about this. So birds, often the male is more elaborately decorated and colorful. So here we have a male zebra finch on the, on the, on the left and a female zebra finch on the right. Uh, peacocks, of course, the female is fairly plain looking and the male is, has v very elaborate plumage, right? And uh, just for the middle-aged men in the audience, this is not a secondary sexual characteristic. This is just something that silly middle-aged men do, buying flashy automobiles and things to attract a mate. It uh, doesn't, doesn't really work. It just makes you look silly, but that is not a, that's not a genetic trait. It's a, it's a behavioral trait. Now, one of the interesting things, there are characteristics about males and females that the opposite sex find attractive, may find attractive. A nice head of hair is often one of them. And one of the things that you'll notice, of course, is that the secondary sexual characteristics generally drop off after the age of reproduction. Age of reproduction is generally considered to be between the ages of 15 and, 15 and 35, something like that. So you notice that a lot of the things that you're attracted to in your partner or whatever will disappear as they get older. That's because they're not needed. Evolution has dispensed with those things after the age of reproduction. It, evolution figures you don't need those things anymore. Those characteristics, those secondary sexual characteristics that attract a mate are no longer needed. So uh, it is not unusual that, you know, you know, of course, that after the mating season, deers lose, the male deers lose their antlers. They actually break them off because they can't stand having them because they're, they're too heavy. And sort of similar things happen to humans as well.
All right. Now let's talk about. So we know that that having sex can 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 lead to conception. Uh, what if you want to have sex without becoming pregnant? Well, that is referred to as contraception. Contraception. All right. So there's several methods to avoid becoming pregnant. Uh, if you, uh, there are several methods where you can have sex and take certain precautions to avoid having becoming pregnant, and they are classified according to several different categories. Barrier methods mean that you literally put some kind of a barrier between the sperm and the egg. Okay, so in this case, you would use the male would put on a condom, which is a rubber sheath that fits over the over the penis and prevents the sperm from getting out. Um, if it's used properly, it is effective at preventing pregnancy about 98% of the time. There is uh, often, sometimes men consider that to, the condom to be uncomfortable, and so they whine about having to put it on. There is a female version of a condom, that which is a larger sheath that you that the female puts on, and it's a it's a rubber tube that fits up inside the vagina. Uh, the surgical methods. These are surgical methods. Male vasectomy. You use surgery to cut the vas deferens, and therefore the sperm can't get to the penis, and that's effective about 99% of the time at preventing pregnancies. In females, the equivalent is tubal ligation. Again, that's about 99% effective. This is where you cut the fallopian tubes and tie a knot in them so that the eggs can't get to the uterus. Uh, the, in the case of the vasectomy, the sperm that are kind of backing up in the in the vas deferens end up being absorbed by the by the vas deferens so it's not like the 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 fluid builds up and they eventually explode or something like that and the same thing is true for the tubal ligation uh, where the, the eggs are basically absorbed by the fallopian tubes because they can't get out. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that, that um, you might ask, are these reverse reversible? The answer is if you cut the vas uh, vas deferens in men, you can reconnect it. Let's say somebody has a vasectomy because they decide they don't want to have any children anymore, and then they change their mind later on and say, "Can they say to the doctor, can you reconnect it? And the answer is yes, most of the time, maybe 70% of the time like that. You can. Uh, that was the last statistic that I saw, was that 70% of the time you could effectively reconnect the vas vas deferens after it's been cut with microsurgery. Uh, tubal ligation, not so much, not so successful. I th the last last thing I saw was something like 30% of the tubal ligations getting reconnected can be, can be fixed. So basically, when you go for these surgical techniques to avoid either getting pregnant or making someone pregnant, they, there's a strong possibility that they could be irreversible and you'll be, end up being sterile for life because of it. Okay, the hormonal methods which we talked about, we talked about the fe female birth control pills. Um, this is where you take a pill every day that contains progesterone that fools the body into thinking that there's already an egg on the loose and you're not going to let any others mature. It is effective about 92% of the time, but it is kind of dangerous for the woman to take birth control pills. Uh, they cause high blood pressure, especially with smokers, right? So it, it's not without a cost. It can cause high blood pressure and possibly heart attacks with the woman who takes them, especially if she's a smoker. All right, behavioral. The one that you will hear from your parents all the time is abstinence, right? That means if you don't have sex, there is a 100% guarantee you will not get pregnant. That's true. Uh, I, I will say, however, that that's much easier to say when you're 50 than to do when you're 20. Uh, but nevertheless, that is a surefire way of avoiding becoming pregnant or from catching um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Now, there is a method that, that a very old method that's been around for hundreds of years, which is referred to as the withdrawal method. Also, the technical term for it is coitus interruptus. Coitus means sexual intercourse. Interruptus, of course, means you interrupt, which means that the, the, male, pu the male pulls out before he's finished. Right? And, and uh, that is, if that is done properly, and it rarely ever is, what, that, what I mean by that is that the men don't want to pull out before they're finished and so therefore they may not and so it's it's rarely it is rarely done properly but even if it is done properly that's only effective about 70 percent of the time because there's a little bit of semen that comes out of the head of the penis the glands comes out of the penis all the time even before ejaculation <laughs>
So that is not a particularly effective way to prevent pregnancy. All right, now here's an interesting historical gem. You can ask the anthropologists and the, and the religious studies people about this. The Catholic Church, which is one of the main branches of Christianity, of course, the Catholic Church believes that you should, it is a sin to do anything that stands in the way of getting pregnant, meaning that they believe that God meant for us to be fertile. And so, and the reason God gave us, made sexual intercourse a pleasurable thing was because he wanted us to have lots of children. And so if you do something to have, so that you can have sex, but putting a barrier between the sex and the, and the, and the procreation, if you put a barrier between that, you're going against God's will and therefore that's a, that's a sin. So as what happens usually with religious arguments and religious debates, uh, the the laymen want to do one thing and the the clergy want to want them to do something else so for year, for for centuries catholics have been saying to the to the priests and the cardinals that 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 organize the catholic church isn't there some way we can we want to have sex but we do, we don't want to have 20 children isn't there something we can do that's not a sin and so then you you know you after a while the priests and the cardinals and the theologians said okay i've thought about this and you know the a woman is generally not fertile during the during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle so if the woman has sex during if you have sexual intercourse with your with your wife if the husband and wife have, you know first of all they say that having sex people that are not married is a sin but if they're married a husband and wife can have sex during the first 11 days of the menstrual cycle because the, there is no egg that's on the loose during the first 11 days. And so that is referred to as the rhythm method. The rhythm method. And the rhythm method is more effective than you might expect. It's effective 90% of the time, about 90% of the time if it's done properly. All right, now let's move on to, a, to an unpleasant subject of sexually transmitted diseases. These are simple diseases that are caused by bacteria or viruses or protozoa that are transmitted through sexual contact, and we call them sexually transmitted diseases. Okay, syphilis is, syphilis can cause birth defects if a pregnant woman has syphilis without realizing it. Gonorrhea is another, is another sexually transmitted disease and so is chlamydia. Syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia are three sexually transmitted diseases that are caused by bacteria and bacteria are easily killed by antibiotics. So if a person knows that they have these bacteria, uh, they can easily be cured by antibiotics. Right. Another sexually transmitted disease is called, uh, wait a minute now, uh, that is not the correct term. Trichom <laughs> Trichomoniasis uh, is actually a, a, a disease that you get from meat. It's actually uh, uh, trichinalis vaginalis is the disease, which is caused by a protozoa. And it's harder to kill protozoa than it is to kill bacteria. So you use a drug called tenedazole uh, to kill them, but they're harder to kill. All right, now there, finally there are some uh, sexually transmitted diseases that are caused by viruses and there are no drugs that will kill a virus because a virus is not alive to begin with. It's simply a, a, uh, a, a few genes that are contained in a capsule called a capsid and you cannot kill a virus because the virus is not alive to begin with. What a virus does is it gets inside your cells and then it usurps or hijacks your cells metabolic machinery and uses uses your cells to make more viruses right? so there's nothing there is no drug that you can use to kill uh, a virus that without killing your cells as well so generally there's only one effective treatment for viruses and that is to avoid catching them in the first place you avoid catching them in the first place through vaccines and when we discussed the uh, when we discussed the lymphatic system we discussed how a vaccine works you grow up a virus and then you inject, you kill it, and then you inject somebody with it, and they will produce a, a primary immune response, and they will be ready to produce a secondary immune response if they ever see the virus when it's when it's viable, when it's ready to infect them. Okay, so there are many, uh, as I said during the th during the immunology section of the course, there are many successful vaccines that we've made. And many that we, there are many diseases that we've never been able to make a, sex, a, a successful vaccine against. Example, herpes genitalis is caused by human herpes virus 2. 
and that causes a blistering, ugly, unsightly blisters on the genitals. We've never been able to make a vaccine to that. Another sexually transmitted disease is called genital warts, which is caused by a class of bacteria, uh, sorry, a class of viruses that are called the, the human papilloma viruses. The word papilloma is a fancy term for wart. And there are several human papilloma viruses. HPV6 causes genital warts. HPV16 causes genital warts as well as cervical cancer. Okay, the the good news is that we have successfully made a very effective vaccine that will protect you from HPV-16. Uh, and the plan was very simple that if this is a sexually transmitted disease, why don't we just give this vaccination to girls before they become sexually active? So give this vaccination to girls at age 10 or 11 before they long before they become sexually active and have to worry about this. But surprisingly, or not surprisingly, depending on what you think about human nature, uh, the use of this vaccine has become controversial. And I'll tell you some sideline stories about that, which are not gonna be on the exam, but just for fun, uh, just as an exercise in anthropology, I'll tell you about some of the resistance to some of these vaccines. And then finally, the AIDS virus is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, and we've never made a vaccine against that. Okay, so as I said, we have made a very successful vaccine against HPV-16, which is 100% effective at preventing cervical cancer due to HPV-16 infection. Uh, there are a lot of people who are opposed to that because they think that it will make, if you protect girls from HPV-16, it will make them promiscuous. Right. So as if the only, you know, that's kind of faulty logic, in my opinion, because you're assuming that the only reason why uh, you're assuming that the reason why a woman would not have sex with people is because she's afraid of dying from a sexually transmitted disease. Right. I think that's kind of silly. If you want your if you want your daughter to be to 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 have the morality that you have, then you you raised her, you can try and do, do your best to infuse those ideas into your children. That's what we all try to do. Uh, but if you have a way of preventing your daughter from dying of cervical cancer, why not use it and say, you know, I want you to be good, but if you can't be good, be careful. At least you're not gonna, be, at least you're not gonna die from making a mistake, even if you just make that mistake once. Uh, just as a little political history, I will not ask you I will not ask you about this on the final. This is just for amusement. But uh, who is the guy? Who are these two guys? Does, do you know who? Do you recognize these two guys? So these two guys on the left is Mitt Romney, who uh, who was one of the contenders who who wanted who who re he ran he ran for president against Barack Obama in 2012, and the guy on the right is Rick Perry, who was the governor of Texas. Right now, Rick Perry. Uh, was a conservative. He is a conservative. Um, but one of the things that he did he, as governor of Texas that I agree with is that he vaccinated, he brought in a voluntary vaccination thing to voluntarily vaccinate girls against HPV-16 and vaccinating them against cervical cancer in Texas. It was voluntary. So if you didn't want your daughter to have the HPV vaccine, you could opt out. Otherwise, they would give her the vaccine. And the Republican Party, the Conservative Party uh, in the United States is against, is one of the parties that sort of as a group believes that uh, vaccinating girls against HPV-16 will make them promiscuous. And so, so Rick Perry ran for the Republican nomination in 2012. And, and one of the main reasons that he didn't get it was because his political party objected to him vaccinating how, are bringing in this vaccination, uh, this this vaccination program for the girls in Texas. So here you see one of the things that cowboys do is they draw their gun and pull the trigger too fast and end up shooting themselves in the foot. So here is Rick Perry dressed up as a Texas cowboy shooting himself in the foot with a vaccine vaccine needle. All right. So uh, which of these contraceptive methods we talked about contraception? Which ones do you think? cause, which ones do you think will protect you from sexually transmitted diseases? Only these two, right? So surgical methods, 
will not protect you from catching bacteria or anything like that or viruses. Neither certainly hormonal methods will not protect you from viruses or bacteria or protozoa, and neither do the neither would the rhythm method or the withdrawal method, coitus interruptus. The only two that that are guaranteed to protect you from from contracting sexually uh, transmitted diseases are the condom, which is not 100% effective, but it's you know it's around 99.999% effective, and abstinence, which is the only thing that actually is 100% effective. Okay, let's finish off by talking about the human gestation and pregnancy periods. All right, so we mentioned the fact that a fertilized egg will travel down the oviduct. Until it and, until it reaches the uterine wall, it reaches the uh, it, it implants itself into the endometrial wall and becomes a trophoblast, which develops into a placenta. And then gastrulation, it it uh, develops the digestive system, and then we turn into an embryo and then a fetus. All right, so the fertilized egg gets fertilized somewhere in here, and it travels down that way, implants into the uterine wall. Trophoblast develops into a placenta, and there's the placenta, and I believe now I'm going to show you the picture of the actual human placenta. Maybe maybe not. I don't know my slideshow as well as I thought. All right. So here is the placenta, and now the pregnancy is divided into three into three different trimesters, three months each for nine months in total. That is the normal human gestation period. So glass, we, have, we start out with a blastula, then we have gastrulation. And as the gastrula forms, we have an inside, a middle, and an outside. The outside in the developing embryo or in the developing gastrula is referred to as the endoderm, meaning the inside. And you will need to know this for the final exam. The endoderm develops in the adult into the lungs and the digestive system. The ectoderm, the outside, develops into the skin and the nervous system, and the mesoderm develops into the muscles generally. So you do need to know the fate of these three layers of the gastrula in the adult. As I said, organogenesis takes place in the first trimester. And uh, it, it, or, uh, uh, in, during the first trimester, that means that there are a lot of things that are being built in the developing embryo and this building, this complicated building process can easily be interrupted or disrupted by teratogens, which are things that cause mutations in a developing baby. Not genetic mutations necessarily, but just mutations in development that cause funny things to happen. Okay, so there's our gastrula. And the gastrula, when it pinches inside like that, it develops into three distinct layers, the, en the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. And we discussed what the, each of those layers will develop into in an adult. Okay, so this is just an illustration of that. All right, so there are three trimesters, the first three months, the second three months, and the last three months. Right, so usually the embryonic embryo starts to form during the first trimester, and then we have the fetus, fetal development during the second, and then the fetus is just getting bigger and bigger during the third trimester, basically. Okay, organogenesis in the first trimester. And then the woman goes into labor. And so labor means delivery of the baby. And there are three stages of labor. Stage one, the cervix dilates, right? So the baby, uh, just before birth, the baby turns upside down. So its head is facing downward, ready to come out of the birth canal first, right? And the baby's head will hit the cervix and that will cause the only example of one of the two examples of positive feedback, homeostatic feedback that I mentioned to you. And that, that is where the stimulus, the baby's head hitting the cervix, causes the cervix to open. It opens the cervix a little bit, and then it, uh, due to positive feedback, it opens even more. So that's stage one of birth or delivery. Stage two is where we have oxytocin being released from the brain and causing the uterine, the muscles outside the uterus to push the baby out. Those are the contractions. This can be induced artificially by injecting a woman with synthetic oxytocin. Uh, the synthetic version of oxytocin is called pitocin. Right? So you can give a, if a woman has been sort of uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, in fact, because of the stage one, and is, you know, the, if the labor is carrying on forever, which it, it's often very long for the first birth, you know, it may be two days, three days, four days that you're in labor, 
and then you know it's fair for the woman to say I've had enough of this let's let's get it over with then you induce artificial oxytocin to cause the stage two to begin okay then after the baby comes out with a lot of pushing and a great deal of pain then a few minutes later you have delivery of the placenta so the placenta has to be delivered separately right so I believe now we'll show the placenta uh, if there's something, if there's some reason why the uh, baby can't come out through the vagina, through the birth canal, you can cut the baby out with a surgical method, which is called a cesarean section. Right? Cesarean section, they usually try to avoid it because that's surgery. It's not, it's not safe to be cutting into the abdomen where the baby is, and it's not good for the mother either. Uh, so they avoid it if they can, but if absolutely necessary, there's something, some reason why the baby shouldn't or can't come out through the birth canal or the vagina. Um, they will do a cesarean section. Okay, there's the placenta. Okay, for stage one of delivery dilation of the cervix stage two contraction of the uterus baby comes out head first the pushing the head out is usually the hardest part and then a few minutes later the placenta comes out as well now in order to get the baby's head out um, about 12 percent of the time the see the interesting thing about evolution is that the human head has been getting bigger and bigger but the human vagina has not kept up with it so the vagina really has to stretch to let a human head out so about 12% of the time, the vagina either has to be deliberately cut or it accidentally rips in order to let the baby out. So this is one of the reasons why you need to give your mother a big hug on Mother's Day because she had to go through a lot to give birth to us. She had, mothers had to go through an incredible amount. So 12% of the time, you have either ripping or cutting of the, of the vagina in order to make it big enough to let the head out. And that's referred to as an episiotomy. So you can see there are two types of episiotomies, one where you cut directly down and one where you cut an, at an angle instead. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, as if that wasn't difficult enough, about 15% of the mothers after giving birth suffer from something called postpartum depression, or PPD. And that is just an, a very acute feeling of anxiety and depression and worry. Uh, so that that's a, a, another unpleasant thing about the birth process. But if you get over all of those things, obviously, everyone that I know that's done it says it was a very rewarding experience. But it, it's not without hazards and it's not without trials and tribulations. All right, so common birth defects. Let's look at some of the things that go wrong during a pregnancy as a result of teratogens. Okay, so a teratogen is a chemical or a biological agent that causes birth defects. So that's one way that you can have birth defects. Another way that you can have birth defects is through an, a genetic accident. We already talked about Down syndrome and uh, aneuploidy. And you can also inherit a mutated gene. So let's just look at a few examples of each. If I ask you about these things on the final exam, it will be multiple choice. So you don't have to memorize these things directly, but I might ask you, and if I do, it'll be multiple choice. All right, so thalidomide was a chemical in the 1960s, just as an interesting historical study. Uh, it was a sedative that was developed in the 1960s, and the drug company that marketed it made a big mistake, which they're not allowed to make anymore. And that big mistake was that they did not test it properly before giving it to people. They, did, they gave it to people and found out that it, there was no problem, but they neglected to give it to, they neglected to feed it to pregnant rats to see if anything would happen. And when pregnant women took the sedative, it caused babies to be born without their arms and legs, without their arms and or legs. That was thalidomide. So this this was very big uh, in in the period of 90 uh, of sorry of about 1961 to 1962. There were several thousand thalidomide babies that were born without arms or legs uh, before they figured out what was going on. And so you see that you will still see some people around today who are in their 50s that may be missing their arms or missing their legs, and it was a result of thalidomide. Alcohol, another teratogen that causes fetal alcohol syndrome. Rubella, talked about it before. German measles can cause congenital rubella syndrome. Syphilis, which is caused by a bacteria called Treponema pallidum, uh, can cause bone defects. And toxoplasmosis, this is an interesting one that you should know about. It's caused by a protozoa called Toxoplasma gondii, which is carried by domestic cats, and it is transmitted to people in cat feces or sometimes undercooked meat. Right? So a pregnant, a pregnant woman should avoid emptying the cat litter box because she doesn't want to catch Toxoplasma gondii uh, and possibly cause a variety of different birth defects for the baby.
All right, this is thalidomide, uh, a drug that was improperly tested. It turned out to be a teratogen. It was meant to be prescribed as a sedative, but when pregnant women talk, uh, took it, this happened sometimes. And so there was a, several thousand people born around the world without arms or legs as a result of thalidomide uh, problems with thalidomide. Interestingly, thalidomide is making a comeback now as a cancer treatment in adults, but it's still something that a pregnant woman should never take. All right, if you catch German measles when you're pregnant and you haven't been immunized to it beforehand, your baby could have congenital rubella syndrome, which includes mental retardation, heart problems, and cataracts, uh, problems with the cornea of the eye. Fetal alcohol syndrome causes a variety of a syndrome, a variety of symptoms, including behavioral problems and possibly mild uh, retardation. You can't really, there's no definitive test that you can do to a child that you suspect has fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, so if you know nothing about whether or not the mother drank too much during pregnancy, uh, you can look at a child who has behavioral problems and if they have uh, kind of a, a, a shallow nasal bridge, uh, epicanthal folds on the eye and a, an indistinct or shallow philtrum. The philtrum is that crease under your nose. Those are signs that it might be fetal alcohol syndrome, but there's no way to tell for certain. Okay, here we have Quasimodo. Quasimodo is in this Disney movie known as The Hunchback of Notre Dame. The Hunchback of Notre Dame was originally a story, uh, a book uh, that was written many hundreds of years ago. And the original Quasimodo was meant to have a hunchback because his mother had syphilis. Uh, and so in a lot of these, these ancient stories from the 19th and 18th centuries, these fiction stories, uh, including The Hunchback of Notre Dame, you would often find a character uh, some character in the in the story that everyone else that has bone deformities and everybody is treating him or her with disrespect or contempt. So, you know, Richard III from Shakespeare's Richard III was supposed to have a hump, hump on his back. Quasimodo from The Hunchback of Notre Dame was supposed to have a hump on his back. Igor from the Frankenstein movies had a hunch on his hump on his back. And when they created these characters, they were trying to they were trying to suggest that people treated these people with contempt because their mother was not virtuous, their mother had syphilis, and that's why they have bone deformities. So that was the you know hopefully we do not we no longer think that way, but that's kind of what they were thinking about in the Middle Ages. And so syphilis, if a pregnant woman has syphilis, the baby could have a number of different deformities of the bone. And toxoplas Toxoplasma gondii causes a disease called toxoplasmosis, which can cause birth defects in a developing child. And as I said, it is carried by domestic house cats, and so a pregnant woman should not be cleaning the cat litter box. Genetic accidents, we've already talked about this. So Down, Down syndrome, trisomy 21, Turner syndrome, monosomy X, those are examples of, of aneuploidy that lead to birth defects genetic accidents that happen in that exact uh, generation. And as I said, the odds of having a Down syndrome child increase with the age of the mother. So that's just something that everyone who's planning on having children should, should be aware of. Um, uh, it's, it's fairly common uh, these days for women to have children quite late, but just be aware that if, if you make that decision, the odds of having a child with Down syndrome increase exponentially up into the 40s. You can see here there's not much risk of having a Down syndrome baby through to the mid-30s, but it starts to increase exponentially towards in the 40s. Inherited genetic mutations, single gene mutations, these are things that are inherited from from parent to child. Uh, inherited from either the father or the mother. So cystic fibrosis is caused by a mutation on chromosome 7. Tay-Sachs caused by a mutation on, to a gene on chromosome 15. Phenylketonuria is caused by a mutation to a gene on chromosome 12. Huntington's is a dominant genetic disease, which means that if one of your parents has it, you, you will have it, or you may have it. You may have it. I'm sorry. It depends on which chromosome you got. Uh, Muscular dystrophy and hemophilia, which we talked about during the blood section of the course. Okay, so these are all single gene mutations that lead to genetic diseases. Two of them are X-linked, so hemophilia and muscular dystrophy are uh, pr problems that mutations to genes that are carried on the X chromosome, 
the thing to remember about that is that there are these diseases tend to be much more common in boys than in girls, in men than in women, because men only have one X. If a woman has two X chromosomes, then the, if, if one of them has a mutation, the other chromosome may not, and therefore she has the ability to kind of hide the fact that she's carrying the mutant gene. Okay, so these are some common X-linked genetic diseases. You already know about hemophilia. Uh, muscular dystrophy is a disease that affects m muscles. And then two relatively minor, minor ones are color blindness. Color blindness, red green color blindness, is the inability inability to tell the difference between red and green. Uh, a lot of men have that. Uh, a few women have it as well, but not nearly as many. And then pattern baldness, of course, is obviously much more uh, much more common in men than in women. And when when you hear that people say that pattern baldness comes from your mother's side of the family, th that's true because. Uh, the gene that determines pattern baldness is on the X chromosome, and you get you males get their single X chromosome from their mother. So that's that's what they mean when they say that. Okay, so we talked about a number of things in this lecture, including hormonal control of ovulation, uh, birth control, con contraception, uh, the stages of embryogenesis and organo organogenesis during the gestation. Uh, we talked about birth defects as well. All right, so this is some of the vocabulary that we went through. All right, and that completes all the lecture material for this course. Course. Uh, good luck on the final exam. I I apologize for the for the COVID-19 pandemic, which forced us to have to move this course onto the internet. Uh, but I think that we're all. I hope that you're. I hope that you're surviving it. I know it's a little bit stressful. But the final exam will be delivered online, and I'll try it. Some of it, uh, one third of it, will be an open book test, and then the other two thirds will will deliver it online, and hopefully it won't be too hard. Okay, thank you for your attention and attendance. Good luck. <laughs>